Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. I'm Paul Clark, and welcome to my studio. Now, today we've got something slightly different. We're going to be doing a questions and answers video. And it won't be just me rabbiting on, there's also plenty of demonstrations as well. So these are questions which have come from the Facebook group as well as the comments here in YouTube. So, I've got my glass of Pinot Noir, so come and join me. So just before we start, um, I did want you to understand that these are purely my opinions and my ideas. And that's the beautiful thing about watercolour painting, there never is only one way of doing anything. So you may find that another artist might tell you a completely different approach, but that's fine. <laughs> so let's get going with the first question. Best reading glasses on? Now this is a question which I get asked a lot. How can I be sure my landscape composition is good? This is from Doug, Leona and Sanjay. Okay, so I've got a couple of sketches here for you. Now this first one is a good example of bad composition. So what I'd like you to do, now bear with me, if you pause the video, and then I'd like you to list all the things that you can see here which you think are wrong and is uncomfortable and doesn't look nice as far as good composition is concerned. Okay, so I hope the thing that you really picked up is how symmetrical everything is and how uncomfortable that looks to the eye. So putting your main feature, your focal point, bang in the middle, never works, never looks nice. And it's the same with your horizon line. You want to try and avoid putting that straight through the middle. We know about our rule of thirds, where we'll normally have two-thirds land, one-third sky, or two-thirds sky, one-third land. But just avoid putting your horizon line straight through the middle there. And as I say, everything is symmetrical here. Clouds, one either side, trees, one either side, even the way the path comes out and splits out in the middle there, just doesn't look right. Now, a couple of other points that you may have missed. I call these touching lines, and this is something which you really want to try and avoid. That's where you might have something like a tree, which actually finishes and meets on exactly the same line as the hill in the background and that just looks uncomfortable. You should either try and put the tree above or contain it down below. And that's exactly the same with there and this little building here. Avoid those touching lines. Something else to consider if you are putting figures for instance into your work, this little couple here with their dog, they're walking out okay which is leading your eye away okay so if you're gonna have these figures best to move them as if they're walking towards the church so you may be sitting there drawing or sketching this scene and that's how things may look but in reality there's no reason why you can't change things around you've got your own artistic license so move things if something looks uncomfortable just move it so if we look at this how can we improve upon it? Well, I hope you'll agree that a similar scene just looks more pleasing to the eye. Yeah, we've got this counterbalance, which is important. The church is now not central. Let's move over towards the right, and we've got a nice balance with a focal point of the church with a much darker, larger tree, okay? There's no touching lines either. The tree now comes above. It doesn't touch. We've got our people walking in towards the church. I've also put this nice little wiggle in the road, which always adds a little bit of interest, and it's just not so symmetrical. You can see with this fence going pretty level, this hedge fairly level with the gate, I've now put it on a slight angle, and again, it's a nice counterbalance. And I hope you'll agree, generally, looks much more pleasing, much more balanced. This is a question from Catherine. I was wondering about mixing different brands and qualities of paints. I have mostly Cotman, but have other odd tubes and wondered about mixing different brands in one painting or even mixing a blue from one brand, say, and a yellow from another. So here's my palette as it is today, but it changes quite often. And at the moment I've got a Winsor & Newton Cobalt Blue and a Lizard & Crimson. That's a Daniel Smith's Cadmine Yellow, a Cotman Orange, 
an M. Graham yellow ochre, Schmincke Paints Grey and Cerulean Blue and the burnt umber there is one of our own paints. So I mix them up all the time and don't have a problem. Okay, so this is an interesting one from Tonya. She says, different styles of painting. I always notice mine are much different than most everybody else's paintings on here and I wonder if I'm doing it wrong. Absolutely not. In fact, you should celebrate the fact that your paintings are different. And that's the wonderful thing about art. Everyone has their own twists. Everyone puts their own little personality into their work. So never, ever worry about your pictures being different. It's one of the lovely things I like about doing my art classes because we'll all paint the same subject, the same topic, and we lay them all out on the desk afterwards and we have a look round. And it's just fantastic to see how everybody's is going to be slightly different, sometimes incredibly different. So no, not at all. You stick with what you paint and how you paint. Okay, next, this is a question from Lynn. My paint beads up in the tray. It doesn't spread out to better see what the mix looks like. How do I season a tray that doesn't bead? Great question. Now this particularly happens with brand new plastic high gloss shiny palettes. So all you need to do really is to get a sponge and a bit of uh, cream cleaner, that yellowy stuff, and give it a good old scrub just to scuff up that high gloss surface. Now it doesn't tend to happen with porcelain palettes, but with plastic palettes I know it can be a real nuisance. Another thing you can do is just to pop it in a dishwasher. Now, be warned, I remember suggesting this once to a lady in my class and she must have had some high-powered industrial dishwasher and it sort of melted her palate. But um, I've put mine through the dishwasher before and it works a treat. Okay, so this is a question from Alan. I'm unsure whether to have ham or chicken in my sandwiches. Any advice would be helpful. Really ridiculous question. You'd obviously have both. Uh, this is a question from Catherine. I understand colour theory but still have difficulty looking at different colours and knowing whether they are warm or cool, especially for mixing. Is there a simple trick to determining this? For example, is this particular blue in my palette cool or a warm blue? I wouldn't say there's a particular trick, but it's always worth reverting back to your colour wheel. Now we know that our warm colours, which represent fire and heat, are always on this side of the wheel, and our cool colours, which we think of as ice and cold, will be on this side of the wheel. Now if we take, for instance, a colour such as French Ultramarine, although it's a cool colour because it's blue, it's still a warm blue, which means that it's up here on this scale. So French Ultramarine would be something around about here because it has that purpley red tinge to it. Whereas if you took a colour like Cerulean Blue, which is a much cooler colour, then you're more down here on this part of the scale. And same with your greens. If you were to look closely at a colour such as Sap Green, you can see that it's just slightly on the warmer side. It's just got a little tinge of red, so it would be somewhere here on the colour wheel. If you took your warm colours, your scarlet reds, your bright reds, then you're clearly here in the very warm area. Now, if we took a colour like alizarin crimson, it's still a warm colour, but it's a cool warm colour, so it's beginning to move around here towards the blue. This is a question from Peter. Which contemporary artists have inspired you? Whoa, probably too many to mention. Um, I really like the work of Joseph Zorbvik, probably pronounced wrong. Um, Alvaro Castanet, I love the way they both put so much freedom and movement in their work. Um, John Blockley, sadly no longer with us, but his daughter Anne just paints beautiful experimental landscapes. Um, Ray Bulkwill, I like the way he puts pastels into his watercolour. Um, there's loads more, but those are the ones that come to mind. This is from Sue. How do you paint something that is white, like those cliffs for example, or a white pet? So where you have large areas of white, all you're doing really is letting the white paper show through and you just leave these areas simply unpainted. 
So in the case of these cliffs, I've left the white chalk area unpainted and the white clouds, and then I would just put in the shadow in some gray to give the definition. And there we can see the white of the paper is still showing through. Jennifer asks, is there a technique to splattering? Oh yes. Okay, so this is what I do. I load up my brush with paint. Now I know some artists just like to tap the top of their brush, but I like to give it a good whack against my finger. And we get lots of lovely little dabs. And of course what happens is as the paint runs out, you get finer and smaller splats. And you can <clears throat> put yourself some circles and get a bit of target practice. Great fun. But then there's also the directional splat and I get that by literally holding the brush and then flicking back and you can get some nice directional splatting. Here yeah, I can just use the dry brush effect. We can turn these splats into a little into a little tree. A little bit of burnt umber with my rigger. Wasn't planning on doing this, but sometimes these things just evolve. <laughs> This is a question from Elaine. I would love a watercolour paper review, how to select the best for the project at hand. Right, so this is um, a question where I already have quite an in-depth video available. So um, if one of your questions hasn't been asked, it's probably because I already have gone into that in some detail. So please have a look down in the description below. You'll come across my channel link, a link from my channel, and it's now got nearly 70 videos there full of a wide range of subjects so please take a look. This is a question from Chaviti. Sorry if I've pronounced that wrong. Because I always struggle with backgrounds my question is how do you make it possible to pre-wet the paper and then layer different colours while the paper is still wet? My paper gets dry so quickly that I'm not even able to go completely with the first colour. Okay, so the important thing to remember here is to have your mixes already pre-mixed because you don't want to spend time mixing or that will dry way too soon. So, in I go with my clean water, straight in, but let it soak into the paper. You don't want surface water, it just needs to nicely soak into the paper. So I just wait a few moments for that to do so. Then, you have to work quickly here, in with my washes. Of course, a lot does depend on how warm the day is. It's quite warm here at the moment in the UK, so things are drying quicker than they normally would. But as you can see, I'm working very quickly, getting my colours in, watching them move and blend. I don't know what this is in particular, but there could be some trees in the distance. But the key to this is really having those mixes already there. Get them in quickly. This is a question from Sandra. As far as palettes go for mixing paint, does it matter if the wells are square, round, slanted, or is it just a matter of preference? Easy to answer, just a matter of preference for me anyway. Okay, so this is a great question from Rose and potentially a bit complicated, but let me go on. What type of brand of alizarin crimson do you use? And if it's not permanent, do you worry about it fading with paintings that you sell? Okay, so if I can explain, some colours, such as alizarin crimson, are known to be fugitive colours, which basically means their light fastness, the ability they have of fading over time, can be in question. Now with most uh, good manufacturers of paint, you will get a light fast rating on the side so you can check which colours are potentially fugitive. 
Now all I can do here is really speak from my own experience is that I've had paintings which I've had on my wall for perhaps 30 years using a standard alizarin crimson and there hasn't been an issue with fading at all. Now perhaps if you had your painting in the window and you lived in the middle of the Arizona desert then yes it's likely to fade over time. However I would say that if you do sell your paintings then perhaps it's worth purchasing the permanent version of these particular fugitive paints and most of the big manufacturers will sell a permanent version just to be on the safe side because you don't want anyone coming back and going hey look me poppies are faded so that's where I am with it not sure if it's answered the question but for me probably now I will be using the uh, permanent versions of Elizabeth and Crimson this is a question from Leslie my question is about loading your brush with pigment and water I always struggle because it seems like I always get too much water how do I make the right consistency? Okay, so getting the right consistency is really a case of trial and error. So what I do is, let's start with some cobalt blue. So I'm just adding some paint into my palette and then adding some water. So I did hear one artist on YouTube, and I wish I could remember their name or I'd give them a credit, referring to these consistencies as the first one a tea consistent consistency so it's something fairly light like so and then it's just a case of adding more pigment into that wash into that mix so now we have what's more of a milk consistency and then again load up your brush with a nice lot of pigment there we have much more of a cream consistency this is a question from Laura do you ever get a block on what to paint and is there anything you can do to get yourself back in the creative mode to be honest I don't think I do um, I spend half my life in a daydream and every time I go out I'm wandering around looking up at buildings and taking pictures and always th thinking of things to try and paint um, I also find websites like Pixabay is a great way to get the mind going because they will have on their home page a selection of hundreds of topics and you can scroll through those and think oh yes I've never painted one of those let's have a look at that um, and I'm always on the outlook for things to paint so it's usually the problem I have is trying to select something narrow it down rather than having a block on not having anything in particular so no I'm always 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 looking for things to paint this is one from Susan I've noticed in many of Paul's paintings he leaves hints of white paper showing through in various places in the painting, which is very effective. How do you know where to do this and why it's effective? So to be honest, this is something that I never really plan. Because if you work fairly quickly like I do, then these little white areas, they just appear. You can see here and here and I just don't get tempted to fill them in because they do add that sparkle, but I don't think you can ever plan for them. Okay, it's just really a simple case of quick brush strokes and just these areas don't get, don't get painted, they just get left. And you can see here, because I'm painting pretty fast, so this grass bank in here, some trees, there's always going to be some areas that are left white and I just leave them. And um, this is a question from John, who won the FA Cup in 1980? That was West Ham. Yeah, an excellent question. Thank you for that, John. What do you mean they've won nothing since? Yeah, true. This one's from Charlene. How to measure paint ratios and is it by approximation? So yes, when I'm talking about paint ratios, it really is an approximation. So if I say a green, which is 50-50 yellow and blue, I'm just trying to guesstimate roughly something that's halfway between the two. So 
So with a green, it's something about there. But all guesswork and clearly it'll come through experience. Okay, this is a question from Russ. Does Paul paint with his board tilted at an angle? Is it preferable to practice at an angle or work on a flat surface? Well, I would say if you're a beginner, definitely a slight angle, about 15 degrees. The good thickness of a paperback book under the front of your drawing board, just to let the paint move a little bit. Now, I know some artists like to paint at really quite a steep angle, but I think if you're starting out, it's quite difficult to control because the paint's going to be moving fairly quickly. So, definitely an angle. Just let that paint move. If it's dead flat, the paint will just stay on the surface and won't move and you won't get a lot of the nice blends and things you're looking for. This is from Denise. I use Arsh 300 GSM 140 pound cold pressed paper. I understand the 140 pounds but not the 300 GSM. Well, really the GSM, which stands for grams per square meter, is just the metric equivalent. I know in the States you use uh, pounds, feet and inches, and we do to a degree here in the UK as well. But in Europe, they tend to use the metric system, and that's really what the GSM is, the metric equivalent. This next one is from Glenis. I have watercolour pencils, but have heard of pastel pencils being used in your tutorials. Can the watercolour pencils be used as effectively as the pastel pencils? So yes, you can use watercolour pencils. They'll work in a very similar way to pastel pencils. The only thing I would say, however, is that a pastel pencil is just that little bit more opaque because it has a chalkiness to it. So I just find the lines and the colour is just that little bit stronger. And of course, the other thing you have to be aware of with watercolour pencils is that they are water soluble, so you've got to be careful you don't get any water on top of your paintings. And this is a question from Natalie. What type of pastels do I use? Well, I tend to use what are known as soft pastels, which are, um, are chalky based, um, other than in the Sennelier ones here, which are nearly all pure pigment, but I don't tend to use the oil pastels. I find them too sticky and don't work particularly well with watercolour. And now for the final question from Tony, and probably the ultimate question, is how do I become a better artist? Well, I think I'd better leave it to these two to explain that one. Well, of course, to become wonderful painters like myself here in Mildred, you just have to do three things. First of all, practice. You just need to practice every single day and you'll get better. And of course, confidence. Confidence plays such a major part in all your painting. And of course, a bloody good three-year-old malt helps. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did and that you found it useful in some way. Please let us know down in the comments if you'd like to see another video and we'll certainly do another questions and answers. But for now, have a great week. Take care everyone. Whoa. <laughs> and I look forward to seeing you all again next week for another Watercolour Wednesday. Cheers now.